Hi, Hi everyone. We were just talking about what we regret or don't regret that we've said publicly <laughs> for those of you joining the tail end of that. Um, hi, welcome to uh, the Vulnerable Futures event. For anyone wishing to use closed captions, please press the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this event is being recorded, so if you don't want to be seen, please turn off your camera and you can send questions directly to me or into the chat, whichever you like. And there's probably time at the end to ask them out loud as well. I'm Amelia Hawke, I'm the artist caretaker at Eastside Projects. Today I'm sort of going to be a bit in the background, it's not really my space to take space today. It's uh, over to Rajni Sana and Neil Ambari. Um, but yeah, do drop me questions if you, if you do want to. As a visual description, I am a white woman with short brown hair, wearing red glasses, and I've got a bit of a blurry background going on. The Vulnerable Futures event supports the exhibition Traveller by Rajni Pereira who's showing in our main gallery until the 6th of August. Please do come down, it's a brilliant show. And there's also an off-site mural that Rajni's done. A lot of the publicity for this event has actually been the off-site mural. The exhibition is part of our programme for the Birmingham 2022 Festival. And for this event, Rajni has invited Neelam Bari Falki and Sana Murani into the conversation. You can expect to hear about their research interests, and Rajni's practice, and each of our guests will introduce themselves. So over to Rajni. Thank you very much, Amelia. Uh, thanks for letting me speak to such esteemed workers as Sana and Nilambri today. I'm super flattered that they would take this on, uh, considering what I've read about them and the things that they've done and are undertaking at this time. Um, I'm a, do you want me to introduce myself like formally? I'm an art, do you, should I describe my appearance? Yes, I'm a brown lady and I am, uh, I have long hair, but you can't see because it's braided behind my head and I'm wearing a t-shirt that says nature is my weapon. Um, and uh, I wanted to welcome Sana and Nilambari and thank them so much for speaking with me today about what they do. And I'm gonna introduce them by reading the blurb on the Eastside Projects event page. Dr. Nilambari Falki is an interdisciplinary researcher in climate vulnerability and resilience to natural hazards in the global South. She brings 10 years of research experience from district, national and international level through her academic and research work in a university, think tank organizations and the NGO sector. She's also a published photographer and filmmaker. Currently, she is the lead researcher for the ESRC funded project entitled Sustaining Island Communities Through Increased Resilience to Clim Climate Change. Dr. Sana Marani is an associate professor in spatial practice with a background in architecture and urban design. She is the deputy director of the doctoral college for the arts and humanities at the University of Plymouth, UK. Sana's main research falls within the field of architecture in particular, the imaginative negotiations of spatial practices and social justice. She focuses on highlighting the impact of transient conditions of war, conflict and displacement on people's creative spatial responses to sudden changes in their built environment and the making or remaking of the concept of home and collective imaginary housing for the future. And I want to sort of start by having each of you, starting with Nilambari, describe your research, in particular where it comes from, so where you have started and where it has gone today. And often, you know, in any, even if it's a small area of research that you're trying to say complete or a very large scope, you will start in one place and end up in a place where you're like, what am I doing one day? But it, there's a reason that you had a thread connecting to that. So that's yeah. what I wanted to know, starting with you, Nilambri, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Rajini, for this very nice introduction. Uh, and welcome everybody for the talk today. Um, my research started by actually on trying to understand uh, how to teach uh, young children about environment. And you know, it started with environmental education with young people, and especially for the uh, for the, for the differently abled. 
so the blind and the deaf and the mute and the I don't know if it's, it's the right terminology, but I use it differently, able people. And that's how my interest started in how to put environmental messaging to the community that do not go through formal systems of education, especially where I come from. I come from India, settled in, uh, in my adopted country of United Kingdom, but my research started in India. And um, then it moved on to understanding of forest rights and conservation and policy in Indian forests. And uh, slowly it also moved on to uh, uh, trying to teach uh, again to the non-lettered who have not been to formal education system about uh, climate change. And then it took on to uh, actually me trying to understand <laughs> what do we mean by climate change? And, you know, what do people understand their perceptions? Because as researchers, we have our own understanding and theoretical understanding and concepts and terminologies, which are not very clear to the common man. And how do we put that through people? Um, that's where my interest took off. And I ended up uh, doing my doctoral degree in um, Sundarbans, which is uh, the world's largest mangrove ecosystem, which is shared by the uh, Bengal, Royal Bengal Tigers and the tribals and the people on the islands. It's um, a cluster of 107 islands, which is habited by 5 million people and um, which is currently experiencing climate change at an accelerated speed from the rest of the world, which is actually adjacent to Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is one of the top countries which is experiencing climate change. And this is the other half of the mangrove ecosystem, which is also accelerated sea level rise and climate change impacts. And that's, that's the study site where I did my doctoral degree. And that's where, where I understood what disaster means. And as Sana and we were discussing a couple of days or yesterday, actually, yeah. disaster is man-made, it is not natural. And what are the policies? What are we doing? How, what, in what situations and places do we keep people that makes them vulnerable? And vulnerable futures is where we are heading to, which is Rajani's very, very apt title, that vulnerable futures is, is where we are heading to. And what are the answers to it? How do we go to, we go to and answer that? And, one responsibility lies with researchers, but also with with uh, cultural, you know, the visual artists, the poets, the historians, the 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 lyricists, the the novel writers, uh, literary people. You know, I mean, it, this is for everybody. The question is open to everybody. Mm -hmm. So I, that's where I'm heading to, and very strongly, I also now on parallel, I am also visual artist. I am a painter, a photographer, and um, and a filmmaker. And my choice is to take the message in the best format, put it across to people. And that's how my journey has started from teaching young kids to now taking the message to adults and young people. But the message is the same about climate crisis, about ecological crisis, about our lives, about your everybody's problems. That's, mm -hmm. I hope that's small. Yeah, <laughs> that is yeah. a fantastic <laughs> answer to what you started doing and what you do now. Yes. It sounds like a lot. And we're, I want to get into at the end of this chat, what we were talking on yesterday, how do you both take care of yourself in all this work? But now, uh, Sana, please, what do you do? Where did you start? And where are you now? Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Rajni and um, Amelia. Um, so to describe myself, it's really weird because um, I describe myself in my own country. So I'm originally from Iraq. Uh, this, it's not an olive skin back there. It is white, <laughs> which is really funny. But here I am olive skin. Um, I have silver hair um, and short hair. And I'm sitting in my office in Plymouth, um, which is where I teach in the university, not here. Um, uh, I teach in the university. Um, mm. So my background is um, I'm an architect by training, um, graduated from Baghdad University. Uh, back in 2003, finished my master's just before the war, the invasion of Iraq started. Um, and when I came out with um, my um, very different views of the world then, uh, because there is a very limited scope to criticality uh, under um, a very suppressed, you know, suppressing kind of regime. So um, there wasn't a lot of critical thinking going on, but my parents had tried really hard to 
show us the world outside of the, the, the kind of the boundaries of where we were. Um, and um, my interest kind of sparked in very different directions. So even though I've got a, a very technical, but also very traditional architectural training, um, I moved on sideways into map making and I was really interested. Um, and in fact, the, the, the interest sparked at the time of um, when we were under the invasion uh, and trying to escape to some form of safety. And um, I was drawing maps, trying to talk to my parents about where is the best route to take, because this would be slightly less um, kind of um, problematic. And I had that in the back of my mind. So um, after finishing the PhD, the first thing I was really interested in is seeing how people navigate the world under trauma. Yeah, under and duress, yeah. Sure. Yeah, and that is it basically for the last um, nearly now uh, 10 years, it's been going in that direction. So I've been working with um, groups of refugees, um, people who are displaced to um, Europe from my part of the world, but elsewhere, um, and to chart um, and understand just what kind of concepts of home, how do they move? Um, so tracing and tracking, but also really trying to map um, objects of displacement that they bring with them and so on and so forth. Right. Um... That's an awesome description of what you do. It actually brings me to my question, first question very easily. So I mapped out, my, I mapped out, I kind of planned out my questions into three parts. And the one of the first parts is called borders. Um, and I wanted to ask both of you, we'll start with you, Sana, and then Nilambari, what is a border? What do you think a border is? How has that idea changed since you were starting your research to now. Borders are being militarized heavily all over the world. They're using crazy words, like they're, they're kind of um, using language to, to engineer kind of eco-apartheid. Uh, using the militarization of borders. Absolutely. And I just wanted to know, just saying that, and that's something that's showing up in the news more and more. We'll get to media and responsibility of messaging a little bit later, but I wanted to know what is a border to each of you? Um, it's a political oppressive um, colonial tool that has been utilized and divided the world. Um, so, you know, just from my interest in maps and uh, looking at the history of how the, the Middle East got divided, it's really interesting. You will see quite a lot of very straight lines. And this was exactly how it got drawn in the sand across and divided communities. Um, uh, when, when the, you know, back in the colonial history. So this is really, I mean, Iraq had its borders drawn in the uh, early um, uh, 1900s. And it was really interesting. People who say we're, we're Mesopotamian, which is what I say, um, because they feel that they belong to a slightly larger entity and um, that tran transitioning of margin. And I like your work, Rajni, on um, this migrating uh, the margin project. And I think there is a lot of in interesting kind of ideas about how we can um, uh, penetrate this hard line, which is basically it's just drawn uh, and then in, in, in lots of places. Do you, think it's just drawn? Do you think it's just drawn? What are the reasons for putting a border down that a nation state might have? It, I mean, it's it's not just protection. It's it's surveillance. It's protection. It's um, marginalization. It's all of those tools. It's basically a a, a militarized um, uh, and weaponized kind of um, 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 hard hard kind of um, sub. Even though even though some places don't actually have uh, objects that stand. You know, like, for example, between um, the States and, and Mexico or, you know, uh, elsewhere, um, it's still militarized in exactly the same way. So across across the Middle East, which is where my work is mostly situated, for example, when the invasion of Iraq happened. So, you know, just for comparison, when the invasion of Iraq happened in 2003, all of our neighboring borders were shut 
So we weren't able to escape outside. And look what's happening, for example, in Ukraine, you know, all of the neighboring borders opened up and, you know, took people in. And there is a lot of, there's a lot of this narrative of difference of, of, of protection of, um, and, it, and, it, and it is a militarized narrative. It's political, it's political economy. Yes. Neil Ambari, what does a border mean to you? What have you seen? What shapes have you seen that take throughout your career as a researcher and worker in this field? Coming from environmental science, geography, human geography, I see it as more as natural formation, rivers, mountain ranges, political right. and cultural, uh, cultural boundaries, fences, walls, that we put about ideas and privileges that uh, different people have. I mean, different um, uh, cultures have. Um, yep. Western or non-Western, you know, uh, East versus West or North versus South. And I see boundaries in, in that aspect, not just political or geographical or uh, military, but also in terms of not just political boundaries, but cultural knowledge and privileges. I think because the powerful side, uh, powerful side always constructs guards, this was based on politics. And I, I see these as, for me, more than fences and walls is, is the imaginary walls that are put in people's minds yes. that are very, very critical and important for me throughout my life. Because while crossing over to UK, I know it's not the geography, it's the culture, it's, it's, it's the mindset. It's, it's, it's my body versus your body and you know your, your mind versus my mind. And that hits me more than going from a, Pre not predominantly brown area into a white area <laughs> or into because I personally do not see color <laughs> you know not that I'm color blind but it's just that I do not see people in colors you know it, I, it, it somehow just evades my eyesight but for me these these cultural uh, constructs and privileges is what hits me the hardest and even in my work I always uh, try to understand this imaginary separation which which we take for, you know, we are so subtle, but are more important. Yeah. Because a passport and a visa can cross that or or not just passport and visa, but also, you know, escape into a border. We can pass that. But crossing these imaginary lines and separations is so hard. How much ever we want to try to integrate, this is where the problem of margins, you know, how much ever you want to integrate into a society, how much you want to become that, or you, how much you want to internalize something. Good, bad, ugly, I don't know. But you know, you want to become something and we are stopped in becoming something. That bothers me a lot more than uh, a passport or a visa. <laughs> so I think this, this, is, this is my main worry. How do we, how do we break these barriers? Sorry, is it me? No. Sorry, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I'm just gonna go on. Do not disturb. That, that's the bell for me. So how do we how do we how do we cross that? It's very alarming actually. <laughs> how do we do that? And I think that's where I'll stop. That's that's right. critical for me. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, we were talking about something yesterday, just in regards to margins and boundaries. Uh -huh. And I want to take those terms up in terms of language that's used. Yesterday, when we were meeting, we talked briefly on the difference between a war refugee and a climate refugee. So in Milambari's case, we're going to have more sort of, you know, climatological references and that dealing like what you're uh, talking about this with this group of this chain of islands that are adjacent to Bangladesh, that certain type of acceleration of um, uh, climate change effect that these seven five million people are having as opposed to folks on the mainland and then that makes me think of people crossing a sea for one reason and then we have what we have just seen on the news which is uh russia's invasion of ukraine and mm -hmm. then ukrainian refugees war refugees coming into for example the united kingdom among other co colonial countries your um sorry Eur european and colonial nations, nation states. So that is, uh, those are two different types of languages that get used on humans at different times during Earth's history, different times of resource abundance versus scarcity fear. And I wanted to 
you both said amazing things yesterday during that meeting. I just want to hear it again. What is the difference, if any, between a war refugee and a climate refugee? Maybe start with Sana. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it, it is incredibly interesting, and we can talk about this forever. I did um, yes. uh, <laughs> at length. I, uh, when I did a, a course in Oxford on um, migration studies, we had a lawyer who was um, uh, basically an expert in human rights. And, you know, we were looking at all of the, the units, the uh, language of what is a refugee and so on and so forth. And what was really interesting is that no one should be called a refugee according to law unless their claim has been settled as, you know, um, legitimate to be called a refugee. So in in kind of uh, in, in, in political terms, in, you, you, you don't instantly call someone a refugee. Now, this was absolutely used for Syrians who crossed through the sea into Europe. No one called them a refugee. They were called asylum seekers. They were called um, all kinds and sorts of different, you know, displaced, uh, you know, people, anything, but not a refugee because they had to claim. And then if their asylum claim is, is validated, then they, but when the Ukrainians ended up having to leave, instantly they were called refugees. And that is the difference between, I mean, you know, those words, will have color to them, will have marginalization, will have colonial history that brings tensions, but also descriptions of what it means. So you asking me, I will tell you that every human is, no human is illegal. So every human has the right to live, to, to, to have a better life. But if you're if you're going across that language of you know political landscape and 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 the law, you will see that it's a very different it's a very different way of using um, those two terms. Right. What would be what do you think would be the purposes of using? It's not derogatory, but like restrictive language on people who are entering a country. What would you what do you think would be the purposes of using language like that against folks seeking asylum? I think it depends on wh where you are and what you're talking about. So, for example, um, in the Middle East, the word refugee is really not a good word to use. Sure. Uh, so so um, uh, people use the word displaced quite often. Um, so, for example, the Palestinians, and that was, you know, ancient, I mean, you know, old history now, it, it, you know, over, over um, coming up to 100 years worth of, worth of history. When they moved to uh, neighboring countries like Lebanon, like Jordan, they were always called displaced. But the, the, that word refugee did not feature until recent history. Um, okay. Now, the word in the West is it incredibly powerful? So a refugee is an enabled person, is a right. person who's accepted, is a person who is given a kind of a, a card to allow them to, to, to cross. But otherwise, they're the smugglers, they're the, you know, they're the criminals, right. they're illegal, they you know, all of those words which mean something else. And it, it, it does affect people and changes narratives about how people think about um, people crossing regardless of where they come from and anything. And this is um, seen as um, certainly more so in the West, in the colonial kind of, let's say, centers of the world, um, more so than, than other parts. Right, right. What, for groups of people, for, for, for people who would like to decelerate or halt the process of criminalizing border crossing, what do you recommend that we can do? What can we do? Oh. We want to stop the criminalization of border crossing. What are uh, some things that you have thought about? Like, oh, we could do this or that thing. So um, one of the slides that you will have, there is a project that I did um, where we basically didn't talk about that. What we talked about is for people who are displaced, 
to describe for themselves to the world what home is to them. Yes. So we, so we tagged on um, cultural um, other aspects of the world of you know the everyday and. Mm -hmm. Just by making that human sound not like a number, because they all give in numbers, right? So there is this, there is this statistics that goes around. But the reality is, when you start to hear the stories, the personal stories that come underneath, then mm -hmm. the connection starts to to be sparked. So I remember when I did the exhibition at the end of the project, and yeah. the group, the group of, of refugees that I was working with came and spoke about the, their experience as part of the project, it was really interesting to hear locals say, actually, you know, they're okay. You know, they're, they've got aspirations just like I have, you know, yes. they lived in a house just like I did. I do. You know, all of those things starts to become a little, and you hear it even in the narrative when, um, um, uh, uh, in the media, when they were talking about refugees from Ukraine escaping the war, they were saying, look at them. They're like us. They, right. They're blonde. You know, they, they drive cars. And that assimilation, that comparison, that closeness of, um, of how it's projected to the world. I remember when, when I came to this country and Iraq was still in turmoil, it still is now nearly 20 years. Oh. But I remember looking at this at the screen and what they were showing. And I was thinking, where is the city, my city? You know, why aren't they showing the really cool stuff, the nice buildings, the, you know, the, the, the river that goes all through with lots of places to sit and have coffee and, you know. No, they show you the worst parts of it. It looks so backwards. And that's what sticks in people's mind is the visual kind of impact of uh, that comparison. And it just looks incredibly not like the life that the Westerners have lived or anything. Of course. So, so, so that stays in the mind and the division and, and the comparison keeps going in the back of people's minds. Yeah, that brings me again to accountability, media and responsibility, but we still got to wait to talk on that because uh, Nilambari, the difference for you between a war refugee and a climate refugee and what you have seen in regards to that. So for me, there is a very clear distinction. There's a refugee, there's a migrant, and there's an internally displaced person. Huh. I think these three things are very, very clearly, and each of them have legally, there are legal rights, and some don't have legal rights. That's the main distinction between that. So refugees are people who, so today there are, I think, there are 20.8 million refugees in the world today. Uh, we say one person is forcibly displaced every two seconds in the world. So we have a lot of people. We have 4.4 million asylum seekers who are waiting to get into countries to have a home. 42 million stateless people. This is 2022 statistics mm -hmm. that has come from Concern Worldwide. We have uh, um, cases of about 8.4 million people waiting in the commissioner of uh, refugees with the United Nations High Commissioner. So for me, it's very, very essential that we get our definitions right. Because if we don't have a definition, we are not going to be able to provide for these people. Yes. And refugees are people who have fled their homes. It's very clear for me that these are people who have fled their homes, crossed international borders, cannot return because of fear of persecution or there's a war, there's, their, their lives are in danger, their families are in danger. These people become refugees. And in many a times, their human rights are violated and threatened. It's very, very clear in these cases. They receive a number of protection under international law. It's very, very clear that refugees don't always settle in one country. They often go and go to a country, ask for help, move along, move along to another country yeah. because of various reasons. This is a very, very clear. And being a refugee is a last resort. Nobody wants to do it. Mm -hmm. What is an internally displaced people? Today, we have a lot of focus on refugees. We have a lot of focus on migrants coming into Europe. But the largest number of people who move are the internally displaced people. And these are the people who are the people who have experienced extreme hardships in their livelihoods within the 
national boundaries. So these are people who are moved because of climate conditions, because rainfall is not coming, or there's a drought, there's a flood, there is a threat to something, there's a fear in their home. There's political sometimes pressure because, you know, in India, for example, if you're in West Bengal, there was uh, for the longest time, there was uh, uh, a Marxist government and people yes. ran away because same with the people moving in internally or people moving for jobs within states, mm -hmm. internally displaced people are the highest number of people. There's a lot of focus in international media on refugees not saying that they don't deserve the, the attention and the care and the concern and the rights and the protection. But we really need to think about internally displaced people who we really forget in the discussion when we, because the headlines in BBC or the CNN is about refugees and um, other kinds of things. So I think for me, IDPs still have some rights within the government, but majority of them do not have rights. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where the problem is. We are just saying that what is an answer? What is an answer? I think the government needs to have policies. Indian government has started now to, after pandemic, to have state policies and national policy for migrants to give them, you know, food rights and banks and money and cash transfers and, you know, children and crashes in the uh, workplaces and things like this. But that was the pandemic. The lesson taught us this that you have to take care of the people who move within your boundaries, because these are the people, if they do not take care of these people within your boundaries, are the people who will then move across boundaries, who then become asylum seekers and refugees in other countries. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we have to honor their rights within our own boundaries first. So I think my concern mainly is with these internally displaced people who become, who are affected by seeing them uh, in some parts of Latin America as well, when the Venezuelan uh, population is moving up north to America, is because of drought, not having able to cultivate, not able to, to have a livelihood or food to eat or education for their children. Or... Oh, we've got a leg. Oh no. But that's a very good expressive. Yes. Kind of. Awesome way to put it. Um, when she comes back, I want to ask on the emphasis on refugees in the media versus internal displacement and the state's own incentives for not publishing those issues on the news. Um, but, oh no, I don't know what we should do. We can just go on until she's back, Sana. Yeah, okay. Is that cool? I don't know how to solve that. Amelia, do you have any ideas? On how to solve. I think she, her, her connection's probably broken. Yeah, yeah, she will probably she'll, come back. She'll join back, yeah. Yeah, um, we can go straight to now. Media and responsibility is like starting to weigh on in this conversation. So I wanted to go to that, Sana, um, on whom can we trust in regards to media and responsibility? Now we live like this. And all the news comes straight into our eyes in the morning, all day long. Um, I'll get up in the morning and I'll see at least three headlines that are, one of them will be incredibly ignorant and the other two, very depressing. So, so, and then, you know, I have the other side of the news, which is I'm an immigrant telling my parents to maybe be, you know, my parents watch Fox and CNN all day long and it's, it reminds me of the idea of the boundary of belonging. When you're gonna to go to a place and you're an immigrant, you want to belong. Yes, you're going to start to absorb the media outlets that the your nation that you're living in is used to. And then you can have your chat with your neighbor and so on. But getting my parents to take responsibility to, for the type of information that they're absorbing into their brains is very, very difficult. And trying to explain show them other new Al Jazeera, trying to show them responsible news outlets and radio programming, which is incredible that of course, you know, they're not interested in, it doesn't have that news entertainment value. Um, and I just wanted to, to get your thoughts on, on who we can trust, who do you trust? You're a researcher. So, you know, there's so, 
it should always that question should always go to you but it's it just it's just not and you know we're really at the mercy of vested interests and how do we break that and whom can we trust in regards to what they want to say because and also because of what me said that made me think what we see on the news it's seeing refugees we don't see the intense issues of internal displacement um and you know migration within nations where there is now scarcity and and huge problems with uh with climate so um um it's interesting so i i i can't tell you who to trust and what to read and what not to read because this is a it, it has a lot of um um, it spirals into another conversation, but also it is um, political, socio-political, potentially um, also, you know, uh, language barrier boundaries to, to, to all of access yeah. um, issues that come into it. But I've been talking to um, quite a few researchers from, so they, they are from the Middle East, but they have gone out into the global metropolis now, and they are researchers in their own right, writing books in English. And I had this interesting conversation with them about the book that I'm writing about Iraq in English. Basically, I am a an, an inside researcher talking about Iraq from outside. And why have I chosen to speak about it in English and not in another language. And what does this mean? So I'm really interested, which I think we touched upon yesterday when you said now people are listening to a lot of brown people talking about stuff. In the past, it used to be just the white Oxbridge, you know, person coming talking about it and everyone goes, oh, they know everything. About our stuff, talking about our stuff. Yeah, I know, I know. Great. This is exactly what I'm saying. And what was really interesting is we had this conversation and it was quite a tense kind of conversation about it. And I bring them back to this um, example. I was like, you know, no one would have known what Orientalism is if Saeed hadn't written about this in English. So actually, if we want to change that narrative, we have to enter in conversation with that narrative and become part of that narrative potentially Yes, reject it, we can do whatever we like, we can, you know, I can decide not to speak about it ever in, in English, but I am trying to make that voice heard, and that's my only tool. Uh, so writing become that thing that um, I can add knowledge in that space, and I can have that knowledge creation coming from a space where it's based on um, people with lived experiences, it's coming from within, but it's written in a language accessible so that I can have some influence on this. So yes, this is not a media answer, but I think um, if you're asking me personally, yeah. I watch I watch a cross between Channel 4, I don't look at BBC at all because they piss me off, and then I look at Guardian stuff, and then I move into Jazeera. I also look at quite a lot of newspapers in Arabic. They also sometimes piss me off, but there is a level of um, detail that comes from that part of the world that absolutely does not appear anywhere in in foreign media. Sure. Um, in Western media. So I need to engage with that level and understand what's going on um, and the political complexity that is going on at the moment. So it's really hard not to engage with it on a daily basis in order for you to get that. But I don't I don't look at numbers. So I, I, I usually really for example, even UNHCR, they've got a they've got a message to tell. And that message is also shrouded in how much access they get to places in order for them to have record numbers of so and so and so and so. And I remember the um, in the war when they were in Iraq when they were doing body count, um, and it always used to be absolutely ridiculous, ridiculously low. 
compared to what people have heard happened in this part or in that part. So yeah. I just, I have, I'm incredibly cynical about numbers and I never just never use them. Right. Neil Ambari, that you have joined us again. Hello. And we, we went into the question of um, who we can trust in regards to media accountability. Something that you said from the question before made me now finally want to get into it, which is what, what is the emphasis on reporting on the state of being, or sorry, refugee cases, refugee matters and refugee numbers versus internal displacement and the issues pertaining to that. And like the way that that sort of connects with the, with the state's own need to tell its people something or not. Yeah. So hard, it's a complex <laughs> question. I mean, my own government would not tell me how many people are moving inside the country. So it's very hard for me. I mean, even our statistics are not something that I would trust. And I agree with Sana that, you know, we, we take it with a pinch of salt, but we do need to have a have some kind of a ball mark point or whatever you call it to understand the uh, numbers even if it is in millions that's enough enough to stark us and to do something so mm -hmm. I would take that number with a pinch of salt but if it's millions I am I am affected and I need to do something about it and that's where I stop and who to understand and accountability I mean I think we always need to cross check I mean I wouldn't BBC has nothing I mean sorry it's empty uh, there's Al Jazeera which I do trust a bit more uh, there is all there's also um, uh, a CNN no <laughs> I mean I, I would not ever and I think uh, I would I would you know you and at CR to some extent I understand Sana's point of view but I do still have some trust left with them uh, I am I am I know I can be a hopeless optimist but I think I want to keep a little bit of trust with the United Nations uh, because I think uh, there is no other way to find out even those millions. And I, I can understand that the numbers and the counts are less, but I would at least be, somebody should shake me and I would, I would go with them with, again, pinch of salt. But accountability, I mean, today the media is so right-wing and, you know, and the politicians are so right-wing and the views are so polarized. I mean, there is no way to get the correct information in the, in the age of fake information. I mean, how do we trust and how do we trust? I mean, even if you, we live in a bubble, bubble information bubbles. If you go to Facebook, we have our echo chambers. We go to Twitter, there are echo chambers. We, yeah. we go to our colleagues, there are colleague echo chambers. I mean, unless we cross the borders and where the crossing borders is, I think artists have a huge role. Artists, researchers, I think, please trust researchers. I would, I know I understand we fall short in uh, coming up with uh, understandable uh, language, but I think there are a number of us who are trying and making efforts to get the message across in our ways. And I think there are a few number of people who are trying their best to do it. And I think researchers is what I would count after those. And uh, at least in migration studies and uh, at least in the in terms of refugees, climate refugees, uh, displaced people, war affected refugees, asylum seekers, I think uh, there is a large amount of vast knowledge available with universities. And I think if anybody in media houses, anybody in the media who is watching today, please go to the university lecturers and researchers and ask them what 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 are the issues of migrants and, and asylum seekers and displaced people and war affected people and please, you will, you will get more information that you would get from a politician. So. Yeah, sure, sure. With less incentive, less agenda behind reporting. Yeah, on there's no money for us. Yeah. There is no, there's no gifts, there's no gold. So I think we can there's give no, that. No for you, yeah, yeah, for sure. That goes to, you know who it goes to. So, yes. I mean, yeah, I think stopping listening to pe those people, stopping listening to politicians and like being skeptical on what the news that is, as you said it really well, is in an echo chamber that just goes and goes and it keeps you in a loop of ignorance. So breaking that by going to the schools, yes? Yeah, go, go, just, back, to, go back to teachers. You, okay, <laughs> can you just go and, and talk to profs? Is it like I that? Think, I think you can write an email. Write an email. I mean, many of the lecturers and professors today are very accessible by emails. Yeah, Just exactly. Google them, get the emails, write to them. I mean, in Birmingham, it's very easy. There is a 
there's a public relations team but if anybody writes to me i can just answer back i can just take a you know see what is legally right of course i do not want to cross step and you know do things but yeah. there is a there is a good channel to answer media media personal questions for us like it's all available hmm. but awareness is something probably is but yeah yep. right uh i have one more question before i go into your practices respective artistic practices um and it's in regards to nilambri you just brought up politicians oh well, yeah agendas. um and i have a kind of a fun question and it it sort of really concerns my parents again i mean we've all got you know old brown parents it's all good but something that concerns me as i watch them grow older in a colony in a you in a uh, sorry western country is uh, is that they don't care so let me talk about it this way sri lanka is at present experiencing one of its worst economical financial resource based um and political crises my even my parents have never seen it you know we left there we were war refugees fleeing the country uh we lived in a crappy part of downtown where our junction had just been blown up so we had to you know the first thing that we did was leave there's a lot of privilege in being able to become cross a border and we were able to leave because my mom was on the news so she was a newscaster we didn't have any type of money or anything because her face was known were we able to leave right so then as sri lanka goes through this crazy migration at this time of anyone who knows anyone leaving the country we've got a huge brain drain we don't have like we are very low on like young people smart people people who could do something they're bouncing and i want to know what you think about caring for the place that you left i find that immigrants will go to a wealthy nation wealthy nation we know that there are many many problems with saying even something like that but they'll go and they'll settle down into an american life and then they'll stop caring about where they came from and i wanted to know your stances on comfort versus criticality and trying to get you know there are a lot of people that i know here who give a lot of care back home so sending money organizing shipping containers full of things me and my mom do it with my temple on a yearly basis but it's just like you know i've got family i've got other friends who just don't care and like the older generation having a very hard time getting them to and i know that trauma might have something to do with this as well as other factors but what is what is what's happening there how can we make people like i don't why does the responsibility for uh you know your land say we don't want to say a nation or a state or anything like that this is the place that gave birth to you why that fizzles how can it be reignited and how we can stop brain drain of of what could potentially be an intellectual class or just a working class in a country to bring it to maybe do something about things there from just leaving I know that's a weird long question. I hope you can feel my own confusion in that question, but it's a murky yucky waters that I've been seeing for long here. Um so so Sana, do you have anything to say on that? I have a a similar history to yours. Uh so um my parents left after after I left. Um but they are very well acquainted with the UK. Um my dad had his PhD in the 70s from Edinburgh. So the, the there is a a long kind of tradition of coming here for the summer and going back and sort of, you know, being being here a bit more. Um I don't see it with my parents as much what you describe I see it with my uncles and aunts who left before so I think the rawness of um uh, how far you know you you mentioned trauma I think it certainly has something to do with it but I remember 
when I first came and I was doing the PhD still, and I was still, a, you know, I was basically an international student at the time. Um, I, I was in agony, not knowing how to feel about being here safe, but also breathing fresh air while I know that they are in hell back yeah. home. And this feeling of mixed guilt, not knowing what to do, not having a lot of resources to do anything with, had actually, you know, tore quite a lot of my, you know, emotion, but also, you know, it drained me. Mm. For so many years before I managed to get them out, the, the, the problem with giving back or returning is really associated with how much development or even getting on its feet, Iraq or any other place that people have left had managed to do, not just by the returnees, but also just by you know the government that is there and what they what they you know trying to do or doing. Right. And the problem that we have is it's deteriorating as we speak every single year it goes from bad to worse mm -hmm. so you know i mentioned yesterday iraq had a big problem political problem now we're facing climate change hitting in the face defrostation a lot of um um uh, drought problems um, uh, you know, lots and lots of crops not growing because of, you know, how many dust storms have been blowing. It is a mix between a man-made neglect, um, intentional um, uh, looting of the internal resources of the country and not having any investment going in. And obviously this is after a very long um, you know, a, a nearly a decade of sanctions before even the war had started that uh, the US um, imposed on Iraq. And again, I see it now happening in Afghanistan with another sanction, you know, sanctioned country. Iran even, I mean, you know, yes, evil, <laughs> you know, evil, evil political powers, but the people who uh, are the, you know, the people who are in there, they're the sufferers, not the governments that basically we're imposing sanctions on. So there is this limited resources to reinvest. Or so I speak to you know, regularly as part of the book. I'm talking to you know lots of people across Iraq, from the north to the south, internally displaced people who've gone through ISIS atrocities, um, people in the in the center of Baghdad who are basically it's it's turned inside out people in the south who are suffering from all kinds and sorts of discriminations and and um, uh, marginalization and, and all of that what is going on is every single one of them wants to go out right wants to leave today tomorrow you know they're absolutely wanting to do that because of lack of you know quality of life there is nothing in there that feels right to mm -hmm. even for me sitting in a privileged position to say oh you need to stay and fight for your for your country a bit further um so i, I give back in different ways um i organize stuff um uh, part of charities or um uh, invest in young women who um want to stay in education further education i do a lot of um networking for people um uh, and i so there is a lot a lot that i can do through that right um, but if you ask me why don't you go back and give back i'd say i can't i you know i, I haven't actually been back it's been 19 years yeah. i don't feel there is a future there but also I am absolutely petrified of being kidnapped and, yeah. you know, so, so there, is, there is this other layer of, it is not safe to go back even. If you ask my parents, they would say, we'll go back just like that if Iraq had, had any form of stability that, you know, they can, um, they can return to, even though that now they are British citizens. But there is, there is this keenness of absolutely would love to go back. Um, go back to what?
Yeah, sure, sure. Neil Ambery? Yes, very quickly. Um, I, I see it as aspiration and desperation. Mm. If people move with aspirations, someone like me. I moved out of India because I wanted to study abroad. I wanted to have different cultural experiences. I wanted to experience a life outside my country. And that's a privilege. That's not always there. There's desperation. There's no choice. People right. move because yeah. they have to. So I see it as aspiration and desperation, within which I see that when there's an aspiration, there's acceptance of the other. There's ex acceptance of yourself. There right. is acceptance of um, culture, uh, um, politics, um, everything, including food or dress or whatever you want to put it. And there, where I see is the capacity to give back. You are in a position then to share what you have with others because you come to a position where you have surplus of thoughts, <laughs> money, experiences, and everything where you're in the position to give back something. Mm. I think I see it that way. And yeah. in desperation is where there's trauma, which Sana mentioned. Relations. There's trauma, there's guilt. Press there's... three. For auction information, press four to repeat yeah. these options. So, and then, and then uh, there's also the everyday survival. I think that is where the maximum energy, emotional, uh, mental, physical goes in and I see these two conflicting things where you see where there's desperation there's trauma guilt everyday survival yeah. well, who am I who are you who are they who are, where am I what am I doing here what, what is my family I and mean, these questions come there with a person like me moving from Mumbai going to Birmingham it's very easy pack my bag go wow wow every, both sides is good for me I get the best of the both worlds when one world collapses the other is there the survival takes over and I think there the capacity to give is reduced just by this one yeah one move sure and I think that is where the thing is it's not that people don't want to give there has to be the capacity the ability and yeah. I do not blame people who do not give back yeah sure because there are people who survive. I mean, I see a lot of Indians who come here, taxi drivers, who are people who, who work in grocery shops, in Tesco's or in Sainsbury's. I mean, I can't expect them to give something who work for like five pounds an hour. I yeah. mean, seriously, what do you expect them to give back to who? And already these people give back half of their salaries. I mean, this is the international migrant income that India gets. Yes. Even within that, people try to give back to their families. They raised families. So I think in the individual ways, many people do many things. Mm -hmm. We are not aware. And I think I'm more forgiving for people who don't give than people who have who don't give. I yeah. will not forgive them. That's so I think my that's anger that's is for people who have right to, you know, yeah. who are not willing to share. And I think my anger comes from these big bankers or the Indian guys who are sitting in London who are doing nothing, yes. absolutely nothing and running away from my own government. Yes. My anger goes to those people then to poor migrants or families or individuals who have run from war. I mean... What do you want to do from them? I mean, I don't expect anything from them as long as they survive and remain happy. Right. They, they are conflicting. I mean, there, there's a conflict. With your parents, I can understand. It's like there's a conflict. Yeah. It's, the conflict is so hard. I mean, it's it's like, you know, like I can talk about my dad. I mean, he, he comes from a freedom fighter thing. He's fought the Britishers. I mean, the, the dad is very old now and he is now 86 years old. He's seen, he's been to prison. And when... When, when you tell him about these things, it's like, what do you talk, talk about? I mean, you know, you just have to, when the trauma is there, they don't want to talk about the British era. They don't want to talk about going to jail. What they want to talk about, I have three girls. I have a nice house. Mm -hmm. I have a, you know, my daughters are in Birmingham. My daughter is in London. And that's, that's it. They're not, they're not angry about me going to England because, okay, we were a British colony. But you know, the, the, the trauma is they want to block everything is a coping mechanism yeah, yeah. and I think probing them to speak about their trauma is I don't do it so I won't tell anybody to scratch someone's wounds I think that's the last thing I think we, we need to understand the generation I think and yeah, the, sure. I look at a lot of Sikhs in Birmingham and you know you can see the eyes and you don't want to ask yeah. because you can see the pain and I think just saying hello or namaste in Hindi does it say yeah. it move on hug kiss whatever you can do 
love people i think that's it yeah sure <laughs> that's sure. that's where i stand with this right yeah. right yeah. thank you so much both really good answers on something that a lot of a lot of younger generation immigrants i mean i wasn't born here but we'll come here and i go i do go back home and we do have these questions we're just kind of like oh what is this sort of stagnation that happens and then and then having a hard time understanding of course a lot in large part because of the news right um and what we're seeing come up in front of us so anyway now i want to go into your respective art practices and talk on them <laughs> sana i can talk about your book first and then we can talk about this work that i'm going to show so let me share my screen please bear with me i was having some problems in the beginning so here we go here we are and this is nilambaris we'll get to that in one moment and here we have sana's book cover as it stands please tell us sana about this work that you propose for the cover of your book to yourself propose to yourself as the cover of your book at this time and also the book so this is um at one iteration um i'm i'm not sure i'm still not sure so the book is um hopefully um going to be finished and published in 24 and um my publisher is bloomsbury um and the book is called rupturing architecture and it is um trying to understand how iraqis um with lived experience of war um uh displacement and sectarian violence lived through between 2003 and 2020 had coped spatially with the trauma and i talk about traumas in in kind of variety of ways it's not just the impact of bombs and shelling and so on and so forth but it's also um um uh, cultural tension sectarian violence that that basically tore apart um iraq and then afterwards um the isis atrocities especially um within the yazidi communities um in the north of iraq so the book is around um this concept of trying to understand the spaces that people used as spaces of refuge during times of trauma so this is um this piece um i don't know if you can tell there is a blanket in the background the, the orange bit is a um a wool blanket and that strip on the side is the satin material and then you can see the stitching within this so this is the blanket that i took out from iraq with me when i left and you can see there is an unpicking of the stitching right in the middle and that's where my mum put put in some money for me so this was part of you know trying to um, hide a bit of money so that i can take out um of iraq with me and the fragments of our house so these are the 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 places where we took refuge when the bombing was happening i did not live through the sectarian violence they did mm -hmm. um and i'm still running after them for an interview and this is another um kind of um really interesting so so i wanted to do the interview a couple of weeks ago and it was right around the time of my dad's um uh, 85th birthday and he said I don't want to do <laughs> I don't want to talk about this uh, around my birthday I you know <laughs> let you know let's move on and then you know I asked them last week and they so I I'm, I'm kind of getting the message that even though they haven't said no they don't want to talk about it um and I have seen this happen across quite a lot of the work that I've been doing is that um it it, it will resemble parts of the memory of those trauma um and every single plate will represent someone's story within within that so i always use an object that meant something with the spatial kind of um qualities of that of, of those spaces of refuge and then these how these sort of um house these demarcations it's is it painted is that No, this yeah. is so this is I don't know if you can see the wall behind me so these are models made 
then I um, photograph them and then I collage them. Wow. Um, and so it's it's a 3D piece that ends up being collaged on top of the object and then photographed. And then a lot of um, thinking about where to put the stuff and changing and all of that sort of stuff comes comes within that process. Fantastic. And then this is proposed as the, uh, okay. And then I can't, I don't know. I really hope you choose this image as the cover. It's a very beautiful piece, very beautiful work. Okay. Well, that's, that's a nice, that's a nice way of, <laughs> yes, I would, I mean, you know, I, I just, yeah. So I keep, I keep working with this and I love the, um, the use of different scales. So um, I always do that in, in my work. So this is another example. So that's part of the project that I did with refugees. This was a refugee um, a female who did not want to show her face. And there was this um, discussion with the photographer of the project who was trying to cover her face with stuff. I don't know, did a lot of things. And I said to him, you know, let's use the work that she is creating because everyone was charting um, through cutouts um, a map of what home meant to them. And that was hers. And they were collaging photographs on top of that from their childhood, things that resemble home to people. Um, so this was the cutout bits of, of the model before it, it, we assembled it. And we just covered part of her face. And she was really pleased with, with that, with, with the way that it kind of shows a little bit of vulnerability, but it doesn't reveal who she is. Yeah, it still acts as almost like a shield or an armor, but you can see this uh, subject behind it. And that's a piece of paper. That's a, that's a card. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the next one. So this was just to kind of, because uh, I, I use maps in different ways. And this was um, one of the ways that I got into the project with the 12 refugees, the, with the way we wanted to speak to people was to engage with the immediate understanding of what a map is. And everyone understands it from the geographical map that is drawn on every, you know, the people put them on walls and everything, and they all look exactly the same. But the maps that we ended up with aren't maps of geographical, political drawn borders. They were the maps that the people created, but we had to chart their journeys on the, one that they understand very quickly and they know and, and they're familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those were the journeys towards the UK. So that was a project done with 12 refugees from across the world, as you can see, um, uh, and how treacherous, but also very different landscapes um, coming from all parts. Right. And then Sana, I wanted to ask you one more thing before we show Nilambari's work as well. So your work has been, um, I want to know about how the idea of the home and housing, ha has, how the idea, how ideas of home and housing have changed as you've done this research for this book, for yourself personally. What does it, what does a home mean to you and what does housing mean? Um, there are many, large cities now that are having housing crises all over the world. And like, you know, while you're describing places that are, have been, you know, uh, tr that have been transient spaces for people in a certain way during a time of trauma and during war, um, even on the daily, now we are seeing growing immigrant populations be transient through spaces. So how how is how has that shown up in your research, and what do you think about that? So it it, it absolutely was the start of the project, especially this project, asking what home is um, to displaces, was based on a a true question that I, I kept on having people asking me. So the people say to me, where's home to you? And I say, I've got a British citizenship, but it, it doesn't make the difference. You always see my face, you always see my color, yeah. and you immediately, well, and, and the accent, and then you immediately associate me with somewhere else, not from here. 
Um, and I understand that, but I had that uh, agony of trying to see, you know, it's a place that I will never go back to. Well, as you know, as it stands, I haven't been back to yet. I've always answered the question by saying Baghdad, which is Baghdad, the, 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 the capital of Iraq, right? So every time someone says to me, where, where is home to you? I say Baghdad. But after having done the project and seeing what came out of the, the absolute colorful and really wonderful ways of uh, expressing what home to people is who are displaced and, and how they associate home um, uh, to themselves. It was really eye-opening because I learned from them. So the project is participatory in its, in its ways of approach. So when I came into it, I had no intentions of imposing the process of how we go on about understanding a few things. The only rules of the game were we asked one question, which is what's home to you, and we intentionally did not speak about trauma. So mm. we did not speak about loss. So it was intentional that we don't focus on this. So what ended up being the focus in order for us to understand those um, spaces of mobility that happened in the middle of that, of that um, journey is to ask about an object or something that holds dear to them that they brought with them. And we tagged every single story and journey on those objects. Mm. So you can see one of them, um, third from the uh, right of the top, there is, a, there is a woman who is wearing her wedding attire. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing that she had with literally a couple of other clothes in a bag, leaving home on her own, escaping uh, domestic violence. And it was really interesting to see when we asked, bring your objects, she went in and she came to university wearing her wedding dress. Right. like full on. Um, and the message was that every single one of them had home represented in something that is very different to, to the other. Some of, you know, some of them cooked and brought stuff. Um, some of them sang and told us, you know, showed us a dance. Um, so we had those of th these kind of cultural moments that was really interesting where, um, uh, a couple of couple of people from the Middle East and a, uh, someone from Azerbaijan was having they were having an absolute massive argument about where Dolma, you know, Dolmat is, oh, um, is originally from. <laughs> the, food, the food fights are my favorite. I actually love them. <laughs> and we literally had this thing where the, no, no, it's obviously Azerbaijani, and you know the others were going no, what are you talking about? And then I came into it like, you're all talking rubbish. It's Iraqi, of course. You know? And, it, you know, it's like about massive. Um, so we hang quite a lot of those identity moments, um, speaking about those um, uh, really sensitive kind of issues. Nearly all of them parted with um, stories that I never asked for. Right. But it was part of just being relaxed in a and feeling safe in a space where they felt that they can share. But I never asked for why they left their countries. So that wasn't a question either. You're right. here, I want to know what home is to you now, knowing that you are displaced. I don't wanna know how you are displaced, whether you are a real refugee or not, whether your asylum case is going to be accepted politically or not. What None, none of that was part of that story. And this is why we felt that home had became, become this very transient and, and lucid kind of um, understanding of, you know, it's one day this, it's one day that, you know, I, I for example, have it as very different answers to what I used to say. Um, uh, and every single time you ask me, it depends on my, you know, mood, I will tell you something else. Yeah, sure. I'm sure. A lot, I think a lot of us can say that who've come from one place and are in another now. Yeah. Depends on how we're feeling. Um, so, Nilambari, can we go into your work that we have here? 
Sure, please, yes. First, we have this stunning photograph and I just want to know what this is of and how, where you were, like when this was taken and what you were doing at that, at this time. So this photograph is taken um, on the Ganges when it enters the Bay of Bengal into the Sundarban, uh, which is a mangrove ecosystem. Um, these are the people I studied. So these are the fisher folks who go into the forested uh, area. So this mangrove forest areas for fishing. So this mm -hmm. is this photo is taken um, around uh, 630 in the morning. And I was going to study my village uh, to the I was traveling to the village and I met these guys. So they they risk their lives and go into the forest to collect honey and catch fish, mm -hmm. uh, always in the danger of being attacked by the Royal Bengal Tiger. Okay. So um, and they have no weapons or anything. They just go like this. And what moved me was really the water that day was really moving. I, it was a nip, it was cold. And um, I didn't want to take it in color because I think uh, when you take it in color, it just becomes, uh, people appreciate color more than black and white. And for me, my memory is always like this. And mm -hmm. for me to capture this movement and to understand, and this was a representation of my feeling and my love towards them and I really wanted to showcase the, the lives of these people in very difficult circumstances mm -hmm. uh, so all that mud that you see is actually silt that comes with the river uh -huh. uh -huh. and it's really sticky and muddy so when you walk onto it it you really go knee deep and imagine being attacked by a tiger then you can't yeah. do anything right no way you can run and right. these risk their lives and this is the fish many of the people in Calcutta buy so um, this is also a reminder of the lives people put and make a livelihood so we can eat well so this has a lot of uh, meaning for me and I, this is this I took during my PhD in the site I lived in on these islands for two and a half years very difficult times with no electricity no uh, toilets uh, no proper drinking water fear of the tigers the houses are made of mud mm -hmm. um, extremely difficult conditions but I'm very thankful that I got the opportunity I learned a lot and that's where my drive comes from so I wanted to show this picture Fantastic. there are three fellows I can see here do you did you know them personally I do not know them personally but I got to know them later because I stopped and talked to them mm -hmm. and later of course, as many villagers and in, in the Asian part, I mean, Sri Lankan, you would know better about this, or maybe even in Baghdad. I mean, they invited me for lunch later and we just oh, yeah. had So I think that goes without saying, you meet and you go, for, go to eat. So I think <laughs> they fished, we came, we ate, and we had a good time. That's lovely. Was it a tasty, tasty meal? Must have been great. Really fresh fish yeah. uh, directly oh. from there. So, I mean, I have nothing to complain. My life was good. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, yes, I know. I actually lived in a man on a mangrove island off the coast of Nicaragua for almost a year. And the it was not there were no predators. There was nothing as such, but the mosquitoes oh, were yeah. a thing. And I got pretty sick yes. living there. But it was, you know, unforgettably beautiful. And the people who lived there were, as you say, it is. Oh, it's, it's something about what's yes. in the water or they were just like very extremely fine people yes i mean um, generosity you don't need money generous because they don't have anything and i feel like the less in some cases or not in a lot of cases especially rural the less they have the more they want to give you because they're in a culture of giving and without that they can't even survive you have no. to be generous to one another yes and yes. I think that that generosity kept me going. So I'm very grateful. Fantastic. I love this picture. I love that. <laughs> story. Um, now. Yes. So this is a series I started uh, while I was doing my PhD. It's a mangrove series. And these are a set of paintings I made uh, while I was on the islands and, you know, trying to understand. And because I had seen a lot of trauma on the islands because of the disasters, a lot of death, a lot of suicides, including a five-year-old child who, whose house I was living and have, have, I've removed his body from the tree. And mm. it, it was the most difficult time of my life. And uh, as research, and I've touched upon this yesterday a bit, but 
this was this painting was the first of the series I started when I, as researchers, when we don't have an emotional output, output I mean, outlet, or we don't have, um, you know, where do, where do researchers take their pain? Where do researchers take their emotions? Where do the researchers take their um, understanding of life in difficult circumstances without writing in journals? I mean, journals don't accept such languages. Oh, right? They only quantify, but, so... There is, you, know, you need graphs, you need, uh, you need <laughs> uh, data sets, you need uh, interviews at the most, but not mm -hmm. the pain of the researchers and not the struggle of the researchers with their own emotions, with the emotions they deal with of, of, this, of the people they work with. I wouldn't call them subjects because these are people who are my co-workers, they are my co-contributors. I don't think they are my subjects because subjects is a very loaded term. I'm not a colonizer. I mean, these are not my subjects. <laughs> so I think these are people who, who are sharing their knowledge with me and they bring a lot of pain with them. They want to share a lot of their lives. I mean, I talked to 500 households you know, during my PhD and I have 500 stories of pain and 500 stories of pain needed an outlet. And Mangrove series was the first of the series that came out of that um, pain, pain of another human beings, you know, and their uh, lives. So I think this is the first painting in that series. <laughs> I yet have to show this somewhere, but I will find a venue soon. <laughs> right. That actually, before I go to the next slide, I want to just quickly ask what, you know, you did mention during our meeting last time, and I would hope that this isn't personal, but you are taking a break at this time. Yes. Um, I am, I am, I am, yes, I'm taking... I think I... I think I need to find a different language of communication, which is not academic which is away from the jargons, away from the, the, away from the things and, you know, talk a different language because I still want to work in the area of climate change and want to talk and communicate the crisis and the ecological crisis. But I think I'm at a crossroad whether I want to continue in academia or want to move into fine arts completely or visual arts completely because I have the option of moving borders or keep both. But I'm taking a break to understand uh, because I think as researchers, we need to give that care and time and understanding for ourselves because we get into teaching and writing and grants and funding and you know all that. And I think uh, there are larger questions in life that we need to pay attention to. And yes, being a sensitive soul, I need to do that. Yes. <laughs> so I think, yeah. Yeah, and you also for the type of work both of you are doing, you need a strong heart. It doesn't come from anywhere. You need to rest and you need to be introspective. Yes. So then this next three. So this this is a series I made. It's called Siku series. It's actually a Inuit word for ice, a Canadian Inuit word for, I mean, you would know that, yes, uh, for ice. And uh, this was, these were displayed in Bilbao in Spain very recently in an art exhibition related to climate change and glaciology with the in International uh, Glaciological Society. Uh, yeah which we you know BC3 uh, research in Bilbao, they had invited me to put up some artwork and I put up this Siku series where the face, first painting is uh, about um, the ice layers and, and the layers that melt and the reindeers can eat and it's about the moss. Mm -hmm. The second is uh, sh sharpness of ice. It's, it's from a Russian uh, inspiration. The third painting is actually an inspiration from uh, Dr. Faria's work about uh, ice bubbles. So when there is ice bubbles get formed is when the ice melts and the formation is so beautiful that I thought that I need to paint it. <laughs> so I, I, I looked through his research papers and find out the graphs and I tried to study his papers and uh, the third painting is dedicated to Dr. Faria, <laughs> who, who I recently met and became friends with. And I thought I would dedicate for his research work. So these are the series uh, which has just got uh, displayed in uh, or exhibited in uh, Bilbao. And um, hopefully I'll bring it to India and UK very soon. Yes. Yeah. Incredible. Thank you for your generosity <laughs> to both of you, for your extreme generosity, patience with my kind of probably ignorance in some areas. I'm an artist, so so this is, and I hope that 
I can be in touch with either or both of you in regards to my work going forward. We didn't really touch on the future, but because of the nature and the kind, sort of urgency and nowness of both of your fields of research, I just wanted to stay in right now. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. I think we're out of time. Yeah, there's three minutes left. Oh, wow. <laughs> We made it. <laughs> we made it. Thank you so much. I love this talk with you. I love it. Thank you. Oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. Yeah. Great to meet you online and hopefully in person one day. That's what I really want. Absolutely. I, I want to go to Canada. So uh, I'm going to try. Just now. don't come in this winter time, Neelam I cool. love snow. Can you see? Oh. I love it. <laughs> it's it's snow and Canadian snow. Snow. That's a different <laughs> I love Shall, snow. I love it. Shall we allow allow a couple of minutes for people if they want to ask questions? What do you yeah. think, Raj Rajni? Yeah, we can do. Um, okay, I don't really interesting. Where would the questions be? I just have remarks. Yes, we it don't. might be that people um, are heading off, but yeah, if they want to, I guess you don't yeah. want me to put we, them in we chat. We really eat up the whole talk. Um, there's even more like I could go on, but uh, every all the remarks here are thank you that it has been very enlightening. Thanks, Matt Gale. Matt Gale worked on the exhibition with me at Inside. He's a really lovely fellow and a very talented artist. Uh, and so many nice thank yous. Oh, thank you guys for tuning in. Yes, thank you for staying all the way as well. Thank you all the way. Folks are so kind, patient out here. Absolutely. Yes, but also thank you to the three of you. It's been, yeah, I think you said this word earlier, I've actually really generous. So thank you all for that. I've really appreciated it as someone who's been listening as well. Thank you for the <laughs> invite and thank you for Rajni for her generosity as well, because uh, oh, you've been with us as well. I'm just asking questions so I can know, so I can know things. I'm just, I just learned during this whole talk. I just learned for an hour and a half. So that was really great. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna get back to work now. I'm here at my studio, so I gotta, I gotta go to work. If there's no questions, if there are no questions, then you know, uh, I'm good to go. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.